Well, good morning and Happy New Year to you all. My name is Luis Cespedes. I have the honor and privilege of serving as Governor Newsom's Judicial Appointment Secretary. Thank you all for joining us on this historic day in this special room, according to my very dear friend, the Honorable Ron Roby, who's the acting PJ in the third DCA, this room was originally designed to be the Supreme Court courtroom, uh, but a Chief Justice uh, vetoed it uh, for reasons that uh, I'll leave to Mr. Roby to tell you when you book your guided tour of the facility. Uh, and as some of you may know, uh, on the first floor on the west side uh, sits the current chambers of the California Supreme Court and chambers for the remaining members of the court. Um, and it has been before the pandemic, uh, the court would meet in Sacramento twice a year, and we hope that that will return very soon. I'd like to express our sincere thanks to Jorge Navarrete, the executive officer of the court, and his wonderful staff for uh, making this day uh, possible. Um, in addition, I'd like to just briefly recognize members of the court who are here, the Honorable uh, Justice Liu, Justice Corrigan, and Justice Kruger. Thank you all for joining us this morning. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Um, I would like to extend a special welcome to the soon-to-be 29th Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, the Honorable Patricia Guerrero, and her lovely family. Uh, unfortunately, her husband Joe and two sons could not be here, but we have with us her sister Claudia, brother-in-law Dan, and nephew Grant. A welcome to you all. Uh, Justice Guerrero will be only the third woman and first Latina to serve as Chief Justice of our state's highest court. From 2011 to 2017, the Supreme Court was composed of women, four women and three men, and following Governor Newsom's nomination of Justice Guerrero to replace Justice Cuellar, uh, that majority returned in March of last year. The swearing in of Justice Kelly Evans will continue that tradition and we extend a warm welcome to her and to her wife, Terry. Unfortunately, her daughter, Caden, could not be with us this morning, but we're thinking of her as well. Governor Newsom and I share a common and uh, deep devotion to the late Senator Robert Kennedy, who was often uh, quoted, uh, often quoted uh, George Bernard Shaw, who said, uh, quote, some men see things as they are and say, why? I dream things that never were and say, why not? Governor, thank you for making the California dream a reality for these extraordinarily kind and distinguished jurists and for your unwavering commitment to equality, inclusion, and justice for all. Thank you, Governor. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Uh, I'd like to call upon Ms. Stephanie Finelli. And before I go, I would be remiss if I didn't also recognize uh, the first partner. And thank you for being here. Stephanie Finelli. Thank you for this wonderful privilege of introducing Kelly Evans. I met Kelly in 1991 when we were 1Ls at King Hall. Even back then, Kelly stood out. It wasn't just her big infectious smile or the fact that she's one of the nicest people you could ever meet. It wasn't even her intellect which was obvious. What stood out for us in law school about Kelly was her commitment to justice. She didn't go to law school to make a ton of money or to impress anybody. Kelly went to law school to make a difference, to be of service. She went to law school to make the legal system work for everyone. Not even for most, but for everyone and especially those the system had traditionally overlooked or even mistreated. That was her focus during law school when she received the Martin Luther King Jr. Award for Public Service, and it's been her focus throughout her legal career. After working as a public defender in Sacramento County, Kelly served during the Clinton administration as a senior trial attorney in the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. Among other things, she worked to reduce officer-involved shootings and improve community and officer safety. For that work, she was awarded another award, the Medal of Achievement by the Washington Metropolitan Police Department. In 2010, Kelly became the Associate Director of the ACLU of Northern California. 
where she managed one of the largest ACLU affiliates in the country. There, she supervised a number of projects and programs, including racial justice, organizing and community engagement, educational equity, criminal justice and drug policy, reproductive justice, death penalty, and technology and civil liberties. In 2014, Kelly served as the California State Bar's Senior Director of Administration of Justice, where she was responsible for planning, directing, and administering the Bar's Access to Justice program. That seeks to provide lower-income Californians with access to legal services. There, she oversaw the budget and personnel, the administration of the Legal Services Trust Fund program, and the distribution of over 30 million dollars of funds to nonprofit legal aid providers in California. And for her work there, she received the State Bar President's Award for her outstanding leadership and to serve fund legal, <coughs> excuse me, to fund legal services for low-income Californians. And I got to watch her receive that award. From 2017 to 2019, Kelly served as the special assistant to Attorney General Javier Becerra as the chief advisor on civil rights, criminal justice reform, and public safety matters for the California Department of Justice. Her work included bail reform, police accountability, prosecutorial integrity, issues regarding the school to prison pipeline, discrimination and bias, LGBTQ plus rights, hate crimes, and gun violence. Thereafter, Kelly was the Chief Deputy Legal, Asser Legal Affairs Secretary for Governor Newsom, where she played a leading role in crafting and implementing the governor's moratorium on the death penalty, enacting historic reforms to strengthen police deadly force laws, improving indigent defense in California, creating a clemency initiative to pardon people who had been prosecuted under discriminatory laws and improving police response to protests and demonstrations. In 2021, Kelly was appointed judge to the Alameda County Superior Court, where she presided over civil and criminal cases, including collaborative court matters, mental health, and diversion calendars. During her time in the trial court, the local trial attorney Trial Attorneys Association selected Kelly as the Alameda County Judge of the Year. And now, of course, she has been nominated and confirmed as an Associate Justice to the California Supreme Court. Kelly has had an incredible career and has done many important things. And that is not due solely to her intellect, which helps us do smart things. But Kelly has a huge heart. She has a strong conscience and abundant integrity. Those qualities and being raised by her amazing grandmother, who I understand her birthday would be tomorrow, Kelly's first day, that has driven her to do great things. And Kelly is who she is. There's a lot of focus these days on being one's authentic self. Kelly had that dialed in 30 years ago. She never tried to be anyone but herself. And in 1991, that was not always easy. Being a 1L in constitutional law when Bowers v. Hardwick was the law of the land, Kelly set an example for the rest of us of being authentic, of being unapologetically herself in a world that was not always warm and welcoming to everyone. Even then, Kelly was an inspiration. And in fact, our law school class elected her to be our commencement speaker because she was a beacon. She was a beacon for authenticity, a beacon for service, and a beacon for, as one of our law school professors used to say, doing well and doing good. What has been a constant for Kelly has been a commitment to justice, a commitment to making the legal system work for everyone, and now she continues that work. I am proud, I am honored, I am humbled to call Kelly Evans my friend, and especially to be able to call her Justice Evans.
And now for our next speaker, and that would be the administrative presiding Justice Judith McConnell. Well, there's always something we forget, isn't there? But <laughs> thank you for remembering that. Governor Newsom, first partner, Siebel Newsom, and distinguished guests. It's a great honor to speak here today on behalf of our new Chief Justice, Patricia Guerrero, and I look forward to working with her in the coming years as she faces the inevitable challenges that come with the position. I am confident she will handle the challenges with great skill and aplomb. Next week, when Kelly was still in law school, 45 years ago, I became a judge. <laughs> And I was presiding judge when you were in law school. So 45 years ago, I became a California judge. And I've had the honor of working with, uh, closely with the last three chief justices. As Chief Justice Malcolm Lucas faced the challenge of implementing the Trial Court Delay Reduction Act, uh, he managed to retrain trial judges in how to handle trials. It was a huge undertaking, as you can imagine, with a court the size of California. That law was passed to deal with the enormous delays that took place in achieving civil justice in California, and we achieved uh, enormous progress. In addition, he oversaw the complete restructuring of the State Judicial Council to make it better serve the, the courts and the community. For Ronald George, as Chief Justice, the biggest challenges came in unifying the superior and municipal courts and transitioning all the courts from local to statewide funding. He did this while also leading the branch in its efforts to eliminate all forms of bias in the courts. These were huge undertakings, as you can imagine. As Chief Justice, Tani Kantil Sakui faced the budget meltdown, worse than budget crises faced periodically by all chiefs. For those of you who have been around as long as I have, it comes and it goes. The budget comes, the budget goes. <laughs> and here we are again, right? Uh, but Tani also had to face a terrible pandemic. And under her leadership, the courts quickly transitioned to virtual courtrooms when they were able to do so. And during her entire tenure, she tirelessly worked to improve civic education in California, establishing a statewide task force on civic learning and the Power of Democracy Committee to implement the recommendations of the task force. We released that task force report in this very room uh, some years ago, I think it was 2016 that we released that report. So I talk about this because I want you all to know that Challenges facing a Chief Justice are nothing new. What challenges will Chief Justice Guerrero face? Inevitably, there will be budget challenges. As I already mentioned, revenues ebb and flow, and recovery from the backlogs of the pandemic needs to be managed statewide, and she will lead that recovery effort statewide. And I, but I'm confident that whatever new challenges may arise, and there are challenges that we don't even know about yet that will come up during her tenure, Chief Justice Guerrero will meet them with grace and skill. She has strength from her family roots in the Imperial Valley and the strong guidance of her parents and grandparents. She has in her purse today the belt buckle that her Dad won for Team Penning. Well, he was a rodeo star in Imperial uh, County. You know, what a hero he was to her. And her parents were inspiration to both Justice Guerrero and her sister Claudia, who is here today. She's shown, shown leadership in her work, both as an attorney, where she quickly rose to partner of a major law firm, and as a judge. She went on the Superior Court, having never done, as far as I know, family law. But she skillfully learned family law and was quickly elevated to be supervising judge of the Superior Court Family Law Division, where she managed a large and diverse group of judges, I think over 29 judges, many of whom were senior in the division and who had been judges for many more years than she, and she did that magnificently. When she joined the Court of Appeal and became a fellow justice on the Fourth District Court of Appeal, 
She used her intellect and skills in technology to quickly research and study new areas of the law, and she easily transitioned to the remote workplace required by the pandemic, continuing to write beautifully and collaborate with her colleagues. As an associate justice on the Supreme Court, she quickly familiarized herself with the unique procedures at the court, and I am confident she will use her great leadership skills to make this great court even better as it serves the people of California. And I'm pleased to see her colleagues here, and I know you will work hard to make sure she succeeds. Since her nomination and confirmation, while she has maintained chambers in San Diego, she also has chambers in Sacramento and San Francisco, and I've observed her enormous commitment to outreach and to learning all the issues she will face as leader of the branch. She is always on the go. I see her in passing. We're still in the same location. I see her in passing, and she's always on the go. And I think we'll continue to do so. Her experience in leadership at the law firm and in the courts will serve her well as she assumes these new commitments. And I expect she will, like her predecessors, bring to the job her unique skills born of her humble beginnings and strong work ethic and her ability to, as Justice Jenkins said at her confirmation hearing, meet people where they are, which is a powerful uh, attribute. Her responsibilities have increased, but so has her resolve. Chief Justice Guerrero, no one will tell you how to do this job, but I can assure you, your colleagues on the Supreme Court, as well as those of us on the lower courts, will do all in our power to assist you in whatever way we can to make sure you and the court succeed. We are proud of our branch and our service to the community and excited to see the new opportunities you will create for us as you lead us forward. And now it is my great honor to turn the podium over to the very wise man who nominated Justice Guerrero, Governor Gavin Newsom. Thank you, Justice. Um, I'll eat your heart out, Jerry Brown. I'll take the wisdom uh, thing. I never heard that in, uh, connected to, uh, to, to my, my status as uh, governor. But it's an honor to be back uh, in a room that continues to be intimidating. We walk in, so silent. Reminds me of my childhood. Of course, I had the pleasure of growing up with uh, Justice Newsom, the judge. And uh, I was as intimidated uh, today as I was uh, growing up watching my dad uh, serve uh, for many, many years on the Superior Court up here in Auburn, uh, and of course the California Court of Appeals in San Francisco. And so it is a long journey uh, from, you know, judge to politician, I guess, and uh, here I am with the privilege and real honor to be able to sort of extend a, a narrative of sorts to uh, this court and its history. And I say a narrative because, you know, I, when Luis was talking, it does remind me you know, it's about stories and it's about individuals. Justice Jenkins, we began when he was doing appointments uh, to make the case it wasn't necessarily about your status with respect, um, uh, you know, at Yale, Harvard or Stanford or any of the places I didn't get into. Um, it was about, you know, those magical moments uh, in your life that created your story and those unique experiences and expressions. Um, you know, Stephanie was making that point. I mean, you know, you know, we all see the world with a different set of eyes. Uh, and, uh, and this notion of authenticity is profoundly powerful and potent. Uh, you know, we all care how much you know, but Google knows more. <laughs> and, and so it's what you're going to do with what you know that matters. And that's shaped by your experiences and your expression, uh, by your challenges, your struggles. And, you know, Luis and Gonzalo, I think one of the special things about our meetings about judicial appointments is it always starts with the story. It starts with that belt buckle. I remember that belt buckle. I remember the story. I remember more about your dad, Justice, than frankly, your academic background. Um, I mean that. And I was reminded of that when I was just down in El Centro. We were down in Mexicali a few weeks ago and I was thinking about your dad and his story. Um, you know, I think that's to me what it's all about. And, and we, we have to bring that, we have to breathe life into the Constitution, our state Constitution, the United States Constitution, and, you know, and, and bring that humility, that grace, that empathy, that care, collaboration, that spirit uh, to the work we do 
uh, in these chambers and, and others. And so uh, it's a special thing uh, to be on this journey together with all of you, uh, to have the privilege of being able to make these uh, appointments. And, uh, you know, not surprising, uh, we're making an appointment from someone else that I admire so greatly in, in Kelly Evans, Justice Evans, who also breathed life, uh, her own expression of life. I mean, she didn't just, wasn't just raised by her grandma. She was raised in public housing by her grandma. Talk about a story that she breathes life into and all the work that she did, um, not only for all those that uh, the justice was referencing, but, but notably over the last few years when we were dealing with social unrest and racial awakening and, and, and bringing a different perspective when we were trying to work with the legislature on, on some of these reforms. And uh, all those things are powerful. To me, they're potent. And frankly, it's the reason they're both here. And it's the reason I'm honored to be here with each and every one of you. Enough of me. Uh, I now would be honored. I think, uh, Justice Evans, I'll begin with you. I have the privilege. So I haven't seen you since I made the appointment. This is amazing. Just on Zoom. So this is, we, she's in real life. Uh, to be able to uh, uh, swear you in. And you know how this goes. <laughs> I'll say hi and you'll state your name and this will be the last time you ever repeat after me. Um, I, I, Kelly Evans, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, against all enemies, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, foreign and domestic, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. To the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you. Once again, I, if you could state your name. I, Patricia Guerrero. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the same. To the same. That I take this obligation freely that I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations, Chief Justice.